was in college, which was a depressingly long time ago, uh, my favorite course was anthropology. And I remember they taught us that when anthropologists study a culture, they have to wear two hats. They observe and they participate. It's called participant observation, uh, appropriately enough. And my, uh, when Margaret Mead, for instance, when she, uh, she studied the Samoan Islanders, she not only took notes, but she lived with them. She wore their clothes. She uh, ate their food and they, she danced their dances. Uh, there's a picture of here, here. Um, so my teacher said that we should try to study some aspect of college culture. And I decided to research the, uh, the great academic tradition of smoking a bong. So I, uh, <laughs> I went out into the field and uh, <laughs> I, I did my observing and I did my participating several times. Uh, and uh, found it very illuminating. Uh, and I actually, I wrote a paper on it. And the thesis of the paper was that this seems like a very laid back, uh, hippy dippy ritual, but it's actually quite competitive. It's all about who can take the biggest bong hit without coughing. Uh, and, and I wrote the paper and I went to Brown University and Brown is the type of college where this paper actually got a passing grade. So uh, in case there are any parents of college age kids who are out there. Uh, so after college, I stopped researching bongs altogether, but I, uh, I did still love the idea of observing and participating at the same time. And I feel very fortunate because I've been able to make my living uh, doing this kind of storytelling. Uh, and I'll just tell you very briefly about a, a couple of my projects using this, uh, this uh, strategy. Uh, I work at Esquire magazine, and uh, a few years ago now, I uh, became interested in outsourcing, and I decided, uh, what if I learned about it by doing it, by outsourcing my life? So I hired a team of people in Bangalore, India, to do everything for me. So they, answer, they answered my phone, they answered my emails for me, they argued with my wife for me. <laughs> Uh, and it was the greatest month of my life because I just sat back and read books and watched movies. Uh, and uh, I think we have a picture of them, uh, my team. Uh, after that, uh, I did a, uh, a few months after that, I, I decided to look into this movement called radical honesty. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but these people believe that you should never lie. But they go further than that. They say, whatever's on your brain, should come out of your mouth, no filter. So I tried that for a month, and that was the worst month of my life. That one, I do not recommend. Uh, the name of the article was, I think you're fat, which I actually never said in my defense, but I said similarly horrible things. Uh, I've written a couple of books, as Rebecca mentioned, with this theme. So uh, my first book was about my quest to be smarter, uh, and uh, because after college, after those anthropology classes, I felt my IQ was in steep decline. So I decided, uh, I remembered when I was a kid, my father had started to read the Encyclopedia Britannica because he loved reading and knowledge. He didn't quite finish, he made it up to the middle of the letter B around Bolivia. So I decided I'm gonna try to finish what he began and remove that black mark from our family history. So uh, I, I got a, uh, a stack of the encyclopedias. It turned out it was a little longer than I anticipated. 33,000 pages. It took me a year and a half. Uh, and it was painful at times, including for those around me. Uh, my wife started to fine me one dollar for every irrelevant fact I inserted into conversation. <laughs> so uh, she, was, uh, she made some money. Uh, but it was also a wonderful experience because I got to spend the, uh, the year with all these fascinating characters from history. And it, and it was also uplifting in the end because uh, I read the whole span of human history. I read the, our highs and our lows. And I felt at the end, it was very clear that our highs, the good that we've done as a species, did outweigh the bad. 
Not by much, they were pretty close, but the good outweighed the bad, and that progress is real. And, uh, and Carol was mentioning, people used to die at age 40. Our lifespans have tripled in the last few hundred years. And the rate of violence, even with the horrors of the World War I, World War II, and terrorism, uh, the rate of human-on-human -human violence has declined precipitously over the centuries. So it, was, it, was, it made me feel good. Uh, so I wanted to do another project along these lines. So uh, I decided to tackle another big book, this time the Bible. And this came about because I grew up with no religion at all. As I say in the book, I'm Jewish, but I'm Jewish in the same way the Olive Garden is Italian. So <laughs> no, no, no offense to the Olive Garden, which has great breadsticks. Uh, but I, I wanted to learn about, I had kids, I wanted to know what to teach them, so I decided one way to learn about the Bible and tell this story is to live it, to learn it from the inside out. So uh, I got a board of spiritual advisors, rabbis, ministers, priests, uh, and then I bought a stack of Bibles and I read them and I wrote down every rule and piece of advice I could find in the Bible. And this turned out to be quite a long list, as you might imagine. This was over 700 rules. And I wanted to follow them all without picking and choosing to see how it would improve my life and maybe how it might have negative impacts as well. So I wanted to follow the famous ones, the, uh, the Ten Commandments. We have a picture here in case you forgot them. Uh, we have, uh, you know, love your neighbor, be fruitful and multiply. And by the way, I was fruitful I'm, and did multiply. I had twin sons during uh, the year, so I take my projects very seriously. Uh, but I also wanted to follow the rules that are not that well known. The Bible says that you cannot uh, shave the corners of your beard. I didn't know where the corners were, so I just let the whole thing grow. Uh, and uh, you can see how it progressed there. Uh, by the end, I had quite some topiary on my chin. Uh, yeah, one more, I think. There it is. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that gasp. That was, that was exciting. Uh, yeah, so, so by the end, I, as you might imagine, I spent a lot of time at airport security with that look. But uh, uh, the Bible also says that you cannot wear clothes made of mixed fibers. This one seemed very strange to me. It seemed, why would God care if I wore a polycotton blend? It seemed like <laughs> micromanaging. So, uh, but I thought, there's no way for me to know if, I, if this has an effect unless I try it. So I did. I got rid of all the polycotton blends. Uh, and it was an incredibly challenging year because I, it was hard for two reasons. The first is that I had to do a moral makeover. You know, the Bible says you cannot covet or lie or gossip. And I live in New York City and work as a journalist. So that's like 80% of my day. Uh, and I had to figure out how to be a better, how to do this moral makeover. And one of the secrets I learned was that it involves storytelling. You've got to pretend that you're a better person and act as if you're a better person and eventually you become a better person. So it's all about tricking the brain, telling a story to the brain. Uh, and they talk about this in cognitive behavioral psychology a lot. It's something as simple as if you force yourself to smile, it tricks your brain and, and uh, you become a little bit happier. Uh, it was also difficult because I had to follow some customs that don't quite jibe with America, modern America. Uh, my, um, uh, the Bible says you cannot touch women during their time of month. And, uh, and if you take Leviticus really literally, you cannot sit on a seat where a woman, a menstruating woman, has sat. My wife found this offensive, so she sat in every seat in our apartment. <laughs> while she was menstruating. And that was, uh, I, so I spent a lot of the year standing. Uh, <laughs> I think there's a, a picture of me standing. Uh, so after, after the year, I did uh, shave my beard and, and went back to mixed fibers. But, but it, the experience really was life-altering in many ways. And I've kept dozens of things from that experiment. Uh, and I, of course, can't go into all of them, but I'll just give you one quick one, which is the idea of gratitude. Because the Bible says that we should give thanks all the time. So I decided I'm going to try that. So I would uh, press the elevator button, and I'd be thankful that the elevator came and that the doors opened. And I'd get into the elevator, and I'd give thanks that 
the elevator didn't plummet to the basement and, and break my collarbone. Uh, and uh, it was a strange way to live because I was doing this hundreds of times a day. But it was also wonderful because you do realize, you start to realize there are hundreds of things that go right every day that we totally take for granted and we focus on the three or four that go wrong. So it really was a life altering experience. Uh, after the Bible, I felt my spirit was a little better off, but uh, my body needed a lot of work. Uh, I, uh, so that was my most recent book about trying to get in shape, because I, I really was, in I was uh, what they call skinny fat. So I looked like a snake that had swallowed a goat. Uh, and, <laughs> and my wife said, I don't want to be a widow in my 40s. You better get in shape. So I gathered a board of medical advisors, uh, you know, doctors and nutritionists, trainers, uh, and I, I tried to revamp every part of my, my health, the diet, exercise, sleep, stress, my sex life. Uh, so I, I tried all sorts of different ways to exercise, running and yoga, upside down yoga. Uh, the, uh, the caveman workout was one of my favorite. This is where you work out like uh, you go to the park and you crawl around on the floor and you throw boulders uh, <laughs> because we should be exercising like cavemen. They didn't go to the gym. Uh, I had to change the way I ate. Uh, no processed foods, of course. Uh, cut way down on sugar, which I do believe is the devil. I buy, I buy that. Uh, I think that, that processed sugar uh, and, and simple carbs will make you fat just by looking at them. So uh, I had to uh, eat differently. I had to slow down. So. Uh, because your mother was right that you, we, we, we chew, we are a nation of underchewers. We need to chew more because the more you chew, the slower you eat. And the slower you eat, the less you eat. And portion control is huge. And uh, so I actually ran across this group on the internet called, uh, they're very passionate about chewing. They call, uh, they call it uh, Chewdyism. And uh, so I, <laughs> I, I sort of became a, a member of Chewdyism. Um, I tried to uh, stop sitting as much as possible because the, the research, I'm sorry that you're sitting now to I break it to you, but the research on sitting is quite alarming. I mean, that it is really, uh, one doctor told me sitting is the new smoking, which uh, uh, <laughs> is disturbing, but there's an element of truth to it. It, it really messes with your metabolism and, and, it, and it is a risk factor for heart disease. So I tried uh, to sit as little as possible. I wrote the book actually while walking on a treadmill. So uh, it took me about 1,200 miles. Uh, and I just found out that Rebecca, uh, Rebecca Sklute, is also a treadmill writer. So I, uh, I was very excited. Um, now this type of storytelling goes by many names. Uh, some people say it's immersion journalism. Some people call it method writing. Uh, some people call it stunt writing. Um, whatever you call it, it has a long history. One of the, my favorite people from the encyclopedia was this woman named Nellie Bly, who was uh, a 19th century woman reporter, and she was fearless. She was actually the inspiration for Lois Lane. Uh, and she uh, worked for Joseph Pulitzer's New York World. She went undercover and, uh, and pretended to be an insane person and exposed the abuses of uh, an insane asylum in New York City and, and got things changed, so she made a difference. In the 1950s, there's, uh, there was a journalist named John Howard Griffin who, uh, who dyed his skin. He was a white man and he dyed his skin and lived for several weeks as a black man in the American South. And he got to experience the indignities of that, uh, uh, both large and, and small. Uh, things like that uh, it was very hard to find a place to go to the bathroom because of the Jim Crow laws. So uh, it, 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 was, uh, it was a very moving book and I think it had an impact. And by the way, it was brilliantly satirized by Eddie Murphy on Saturday Night Live. If anyone ever remembers that, he did a, a piece called White Like Me. It's definitely worth YouTubing. Uh, George Plimpton uh, did this in, uh, in sports, so he tried out uh, to uh, be on a major league baseball team and a football team. Uh, most impressive to me is he got socked in the jaw by a heavyweight fighter. Uh, and uh, this is this genre, I love to read it, and it's not always successful. There are some terrible examples of it, but if it's done well, I think it's a very powerful way to tell a story and to allow the reader to see the world through different eyes. Uh, and it can, it can really uh, inspire empathy. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read 
Well, I read Erin Reich's book, Nickel and Dimed, but it's a wonderful book, and it's about her working low-paying, menial jobs. And I feel that if you read this and it doesn't change the way you think about hotel maids or fast food uh, workers, then you have a heart of stone, because <laughs> it's a really moving uh, book. Uh, and my greatest hope is that this storytelling, this kind of storytelling, inspires people to do their own experiments. Uh, because I really do think that trying things out is one of the keys to happiness. And, and my favorite emails are when people say that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to gossip for a week, or uh, I'm, I'm going to get off sugar for a couple of days, or, or even something small, like uh, uh, I'm trying a new toothpaste. So um, <laughs> it's something, uh, anything to get you out of your rut. Uh, so we think, uh, we often think that changing your mind is, is the key to changing your behavior. But, but from these experiments, this type of storytelling, I've often found it's the other way around. You change your behavior and your mind follows. Uh, and I'll end with a quote that I wish I made up, but I didn't. But uh, it's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting. So thank you very much.